Today's message is titled, The Courage to Be. In college, I interned on an organic farm in northern Bayfield County. It was what one might call an alternative lifestyle. It is really off the grid. Interning meant hand hauling water when there wasn't enough solar or wind to power the well pump. It meant brain tanning the hides of roadkill that we would find on the sides of the highway. It meant cooking on a wood cook stove even in July. It is where I learned to harvest wild ginger. So I guess I wasn't that surprised when one of the farmers from this farm, Anne, uh, was selected to be a contestant on the History Channel's Alone reality TV. So I'd never watched this show before, but to cheer Anne on, I decided to tune in on Thursday nights, and I got to watch 10 people getting dropped off in these remote wilderness areas. They get to choose 10 things to bring with them, and the one who survives the longest without either being pulled because they have malnutrition or injury, um, who willingly tap out because of whatever reason, um, the one that makes it the longest gets $500,000. So given that this is the 10th season, I thought I'll do a little research. I'll go back and see what is Anne getting herself into? What happened on previous episodes? And I found that there were contestants that made it 50, 60, 70, even one person that made it 100 days in these conditions. Others left within the first week. As I watched the past seasons, I began to see some patterns. It was really surprising. One of them was that the people that were the most heroic in the sense that they went out and they hunted and they built their shelter and they you know, really uh, dove into this challenge, they were the ones that exhausted their energy. They left early because of starvation or malnutrition. It was the people who had the courage to rest, to be simple about where they put their energy. It was the people who had a spiritual practice, who grounded themselves every day, or paused for joy and videotaped themselves in these hilarious moments. They were the ones who were thriving but even those who did win or get to that 60 or 70 day mark were often on the brink of starvation. Even with their bows and arrows, their skills, all of them, you have to have amazing survival skills just to be on this show. The healthy and abundant ecosystems that are chosen for these places, um, for these shows, it was clear that no one can survive alone in the wilderness. I really don't think that is too much different than the wilderness we navigate from day to day. Whether it's the wilderness of illness, divorce or separation from loved ones, grief or loss, a changing climate, atmospherically or politically, or maybe both. Anything that causes us to feel or be alienated or alone is really difficult to survive. We may have the skills and resolve to be strong, but perhaps what we need is the courage to be. The courage to be, what a strange title, but perhaps it's also familiar to some of you. Is that anyone? Okay. It is the title of a book that Paul Tillich wrote in 1952, The Courage to Be. Now, Tillich is a fascinating, Paul Tillich is a fascinating individual, and he's so influential that there's actually Tillichians, people who study Paul's work and build off of it, even today. So there could be a whole semester worth of talks about his ideas and philosophies, but for today, I want to share two things, not so much about his philosophy or his religious inquiry, but about his life. The first that I think we need to understand when talking about Paul Tillich is that he was an army chaplain in World War I. It was devastating. He was tasked with ministering to the wounded. He was tasked with going to the battlefields after the devastation. He talked about 
Everything he'd thought about humankind and God was naive before these experiences. Now second, Paul Tillich was an early critic of the Nazi regime. And he said, his words were that he had the honor of being the first non-Jewish um, professor that was banned from teaching in German universities because of his outspoken critiques. He was a refugee. He had to flee Germany. And he was given refuge at Union Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, my, that's my alma mater. He was, <laughs> he was given refuge at Union the Theological Seminary of New York City. <laughs> They're both great schools. So he had to learn to speak and teach in English in a very short period of time. So some postulate that Paul Tillich would be totally inaccessible to so many of us. He was so dense, he was so brilliant, that he, since he had to translate all of his ideas into English, it allows for so many of us to be able to read them and understand them. But it was his experience and then the translation of that experience into a common language that many could understand that I think is really, really important to understand where his ideas came from. In a sense, he had to find a new language for religious inquiry. So faith, according to Paul Tillich, faith is not a belief. Instead, faith is the state of being ultimately concerned. Faith is the state of being ultimately concerned. So it's not something we do, it's something we are. And he wrote that everyone has an ultimate concern. Some are examined, some are not. Tillich doesn't tell us, or his work doesn't tell us what that ultimate concern should be, what his necessarily is, but asks us to consider if it's truly ultimate, or perhaps if it's something an idol or something material that will not endure, that that is where we are putting our faith our ultimate concern into. So words like ultimate concern may connotate that sort of almighty God, that all-powerful God on high vision. But Paul Tillich actually developed what was called a ground of being theology. So his idea of the ultimate God was not a being at all. It wasn't a supernatural presence it was the source of being itself, the ground of our being. So he wrote that true atheism doesn't exist. There can't be such a thing because everyone has an ultimate concern. It's just a matter of what that concern is, what one has faith in. So Tillich's work is very much reacting to the anxieties of his day one in which the great catastrophe, the Holocaust, and two world wars were unveiling the capabilities of the authority of God and governments of humankind. And it was pretty devastating, of course. It was a time when meaninglessness, when atheism was what people were gravitating towards. There's nothing to believe in. There's no meaning anywhere. There's no hope. So his work was in response to the world he was living in based on the experiences that he had in World War I where he hadn't lost faith, but he had to reinterpret it, translate it. And he translated it into the word courage. He wrote the courage to be is the courage to accept oneself, being, in spite of being unacceptable. I don't know about you, but if you've ever had times in your life where something has been revealed, whether it's after an illness or after a tragedy or some of the things that, I mean, we could just go on and on with the things that are unacceptable about the world that we live in, the, the parts and pieces that are devastating. He wrote that the courage to be is to accept being despite all of that. 
And courage, he wrote, has revealing power. The courage to be is the key to being itself. So it's the correlation between what happens in our world, in our lives, and not just how we find meaning in it, but that there's meaning in being itself. The ground of being can be described as indeterminate, a power source that interacts with the depths of all things. And Tillich's work is perhaps so influential because it offers a grounded answer. No matter what we are going through, no matter what is happening in the world, in our world it might be gun violence. In his world, it was mass wars. But it offers something to the question, why is there being rather than non-being? Why is there something rather than nothing? And he wrote then that the courage is to find the meaning in being itself, despite all of that. So Brene Brown also wrote about courage. She's a social scientist and author, and I think her uh, work with courage helped me to think a little bit more about what Paul Tillich might be trying to get at here. She wrote that courage is a heart word. The root of the word courage is core, the Latin word for heart. In one of the earliest for forms, the word courage meant to speak one's mind by telling one's heart. Over time, this definition has changed, she writes, and today we typically associate courage with heroic and brave deeds. But this definition fails, the definition that courage is brave and heroic deed fails to recognize the inner strength and level of commitment required for us to actually speak honestly and openly about who we are and about our experiences, good and bad. So what is calling you to have courage right now? Not to do something not to do anything at all, but to be, despite. When Chuck shared the idea of playing Amelia Earhart's Last Flight, I thought, how come might I bring that into the theme of today's service? And I thought, gosh, you know, Amelia Earhart is one of those people who we remember for brave and heroic deeds, right? She's sort of an idol, the first woman of the air. I love it. But often when people's human sides get revealed, idols come crashing down. We've seen that so much in the last few years as complex stories have been told. And as I looked into Amelia Earhart's story, she was also an author, and she wrote a lot about what brought her to flight and what she learned there. She wrote that she was lured to the sky out of beauty. The beauty of flight was what brought her there, not, not the effort to change you know, records or be the first woman to do that or this. And, and we know her as the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. That's amazing. And what a wilderness that must be, alone in the air, the vastness of the sky. But she talked also that she never did it alone. She said, yes, when I'm up there, I'm solo, but it's actually all of the people that helped me that made it possible for me to even be there, all the people that I'm communicating with, all the support, all the troubleshooting that others had shown me that made this possible. So she wrote about courage in this way. Courage is the price that life exacts for granting peace. The soul that knows it not knows no release from little things. In other words, she had to be her calling. It took courage to do these things, but without that, she would have had no peace. And she said, the more one does and sees and feels, the more one is able to do, and the more genuine may be one's appreciation of fundamental things like home and love and understanding of companionship. So it was going out alone into the wilderness that made Amelia realize that the foundation was love and home and companionship. It's interesting that the TV show alone that I've been researching and watching mirrors this as well. 
people definitely leave because of injuries and, and not able to procure enough food, but a surprising, to me, a surprising amount leave the $500,000 on the table because they missed their family, because they had a duty at home that they left. They talk about their pets with such adoration and longing. They realize that this prize money of $500,000 is not ultimate. That is not their ultimate concern. Something else draws them away, and it's often those that they love. Reflecting on this makes me realize that perhaps the deepest and most abiding, abiding courage is sometimes also invisible. It is the courage of those who experience chronic loneliness, who endure loss or grief, or perhaps those that are returning from their own wilderness journey, looking to come back to making connections, realizing that we are incapable of surviving alone. My friends, there are so many reasons to be cynical about the world today. There's so many reasons to be cynical about religion today. I just attended General Assembly, the national gathering and business meetings of the Unitarian Universalist Association, and I added a few more reasons to be cynical about religion today, <laughs> about this tradition in particular. But at the same time, I found just as many reasons for hope. As I reflect on the small fellowships that I work with here and in the Schwamigan Bay of, of Ashland, I am astounded at the courage that it takes to be in religious community, to share joys and concerns, to, to keep a space open and going even when it might not be meeting our needs to be the hope for the world, for whoever may come through the door, not knowing who that is, to be holding up windows and mirrors for one another to examine what is ultimate and to help find meaning in being itself, to have the well-examined faith that allows us to go on despite. If you enjoyed the poem I read at the chalice lighting today, I've left copies. It was just an excerpt, The Courage. Um, it's a beautiful poem, and it, and it leaves the courage to blank. That's the title of the poem. If that was speaking to you, if you are looking for some of that today, feel free to pick up one of those poems as you leave. The courage um, that we are talking about today is one that I find in Unitarian Universalism. It's one that I find uh, in any of these small, especially rural communities where we are experimenting with a religion that says you and your beliefs are welcome right alongside mine at a time when religion is considered superfluous or is often grabbed onto as a weapon to defend one's own beliefs. To be part of a religious community that is in dialogue with meaning to have the courage um, to be open-hearted is pretty amazing, and I'm really grateful that I get to share that with you all. I think it actually takes more courage than being dropped off in the wilderness, because this is what allows us to face the wilderness of our lives and know that we aren't alone. Amen. Our closing